everyone, and thank you for joining me again today on the Finding Hope After Loss podcast. I am planning on doing a special episode to talk about how to deal with grief during the holidays. This time of year is really hard in general, especially when going through infertility or the loss of a child. If there are any questions that you would like to hear answered about this topic, you can email them to me at sarah, S-A-R-A-H, at journeyforjasmine.com, or you can send them through Instagram or Facebook um, at Journey for Jasmine. And as always, if you ever need someone to just be a listening ear, you can always reach out to me. Remember, you don't have to go through it alone. So today I am talking with Kendra. She went through infertility and had a miscarriage before she was later diagnosed with PCOS. She took matters into her own hands and took control of her own health in order to get pregnant after having some really bad experiences with her medical providers. She is now a health coach and a bereavement doula with her company she started called Bravely She Blooms Wellness. Hello, everyone. Today, I am here with Kendra. Kendra, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, so I'm glad to be here. And um, I live in Georgia and I'm originally from Maine. I'm in the mountains area, the beautiful part of the state. Um, So I'm 32 and in my free time, I would say I love to create fun experiences with my son and husband. Um, My son is two. So, um, you know, life is everything is fun and new. And um, so it's very easy to create fun experiences. Um, So, yeah, I'm happy to be here and happy to share my story. Yeah, two is definitely a, a fun age when they when they still find everything fun. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Yes. So can you talk a little bit about uh, your infertility and loss journey? Yeah, so um, I would say it kind of all started. We had been married for a year. So 2018 was kind of our year mark of being married and um, we knew we were ready for kids and I had happened to miss a few cycles, which um, I was for on birth control for years. And after getting off of it, my cycle was never normal. Um, and I kind of was in the generation of just get on birth control. And that's that, you know, that's just every, you know, that takes care of everything. So after getting off of it, um, way before we got married, um, my cycle really wasn't normal. Um, I never even thought anything of it. Um, and then we got married and then I had missed three in a row, which was a little abnormal. So I knew probably needed to go to the doctors and get that, um, looked into and, um, through blood work, um, they shared with me that I had low progesterone and an excess of estrogen. So my journey is really um, focused more on like hormones and balance, finding the balance and imbalances. And um, I kind of changed my lifestyle. So to condense it a little bit, um, we had, after I missed the cycles and learned I had a hormonal imbalance, I started um, changing my life. And um, that kind of started with addressing my sleep, addressing my stress, addressing how I nourish my body and how I movement and physical activity and how I release stress and how I find calm methods through my days. Um, so I, we had started trying and along with that, changed my lifestyle and, um, we had been trying for about 16 months and, um, I had started at one doctor and didn't feel like she really, um, gave me what I needed. And she was the one that told me I had low progesterone and she kind of left it at that. So I was on my own to research and, you know, figure out what I needed And so I kind of moved on to a bigger area um, that was more well-known. And from there, I made an appointment because I knew everywhere, everything you look at says um, they can't really help until you've been trying for a year. So, you know, I was like, okay. So at about 11 months, I made an appointment 
and um, went in and she, we were still trying, of course. And she was like, oh, you're fine. You're young. Just let, you know, don't think about it. All, all the things that people say. So um, that was not very comforting. And so um, from there, we kept trying, um, you know, and as the months go on, your stress grows. Um, you're trying each month. It's like a devastation. So you have to kind of find ways to build yourself back up to read, to do it again the next month. And, um, you know, it's, it's a lot mentally. Um, and I, I would say that I found a lot of coping skills and mechanisms through, um, yoga and calm movements where I could just kind of focus on my breath and release tension. And I did work a lot. And I think that definitely kept stress a little bit higher because, you know, you're kind of always exhausted. Um, so, but I did learn that I was operating on a sleep deprivation, probably like five hours a night for years. And so I quickly changed that. And that really shifted everything. And um, 2020 came around, which was stressful for everyone. And, you know, we had been trying for a long while then. And um, July, well, June of 2020, we got pregnant after 16 months. And, um, you know, every, it was amazing. It was so exciting. You know, at some point you have to wonder if it's going to happen or not. And you're kind of like, this may not be our path. So getting pregnant was such a blessing. And, um, from there, um, I, I wouldn't say it was normal to begin with at all through the whole experience of being pregnant for the first time. Um, I, at about four and a half weeks, five weeks, um, I had started spotting brown blood and, um, you know, it was pretty painful, the, the whole pregnancy to start and I had nothing to compare it to. So I was like, okay, that's, that's what pregnancy is. Okay. And so, um, I had called the doctor. I hadn't even had the first appointment yet to confirm pregnancy or anything and called her about the blood and everything. And they were like, you know, just rest and it's fine. Like there was no support there. And I, you know, was sharing, confiding in a trusted coworker, what I was experiencing and cause nobody knew I was pregnant. Um, and I, I wish I could go back and change that a little bit because it was there that I was informed that it could be ectopic in a setting like that should have been in a medical setting or in a setting where I could have gotten questions answered. Um, so I depended on Dr. Google for everything. And um, ectopic is very scary. Uh, it's I wouldn't suggest looking it up online. So, you know, I carried all this weight of like, okay, this could be nothing or it could be this terrible thing and finally made it to the first doctor's appointment and um, the spotting didn't get worse. It didn't get better, but it was still there. And, you know, I knew about progesterone. I really knew about hormones. I knew what was needed to have a successful pregnancy and in the room, it was just me and um, she was sharing like, you know, whatever. To, she was kind of just keeping me calm, I guess. And um, I was like, well, I've been on progesterone. I know that um, that is crucial to support a pregnancy. And I know that brown blood isn't good. And um she kind of laughed and said, yeah, progesterone is just a band-aid. And so, you know, uh, in that setting, I was like totally diminished. And I just kind of got quiet because when somebody makes you feel small, you're not going to, you know, keep standing up for yourself. So she led into, it could be ectopic or you could be very early and anybody that's trying to get pregnant, they know exactly the timeline. There's no, no, I, I really do know, but she just kept saying, you're probably really early. 
So nothing came out of that appointment. And I think they had scheduled one for about eight weeks. And um, so I had a, a few weeks in there where I had to uh, try to be okay. And the pregnancy grew to be quite painful and it was designated in one spot. So it was kind of, you know, in your head, it's like you want to stay positive, but the con you're consuming yourself with all this knowledge from Google. So it's like torment and really unhealthy. And I would just sit online and my husband would have to take my phone away every night because I would just, it would just be really stressful. And um, the insomnia kind of started to grow. The pain started to grow. And um, I just kept working hard and just, tried to ignore it but you can't and um at I think it was seven weeks and in between like the four or five week checkup and seven weeks I had called the doctors numerous times because you know I was spotting still and um the day of the appointment came and um, I woke up and was bleeding very heavily um I was aware that that was not a good sign, um, but, you know, nobody ever led me to believe that it, this could be a mis, you know, it was just so jumbled and so misinformed. And um, we, I did, my husband came with me because I, I just had this feeling that he needed to be there and um, they get me in the room and they were trying to do an ultrasound to, cause the baby would have been at a point where they could have seen it now. And, um, they couldn't find the sack. They, it was really just so unprofessionally handled and they had to do a, a probe vaginally because they couldn't find anything through the ultrasound. And they kept saying, you could be very early, all the things that they were saying before. And, um, I mean, they were up there for like, 25 minutes and it was so painful and um as I was bleeding heavily and they just kept kind of mumbling oh what's that what's you know like very misleading just things that probably shouldn't have even been said it was very torturous and the person doing it she kind of walked out of the room and I I mean it was like 20 minutes of just letting us sit there in our like mind just going crazy and I was hysterical and um about four it was a couple of nurses and a couple of doctors came back in the room and um then you know I'm hysterical there's a nurse that's like why is she crying it was just so traumatic and painful uh, I think in that moment, that's what catapulted my whole journey of helping others because of the way I was treated. But um, the doctor did say it wasn't a viable pregnancy, but when you're experiencing trauma, you don't hear those things and you, you, you know, you just go kind of numb, you go within. I just remember hearing my own heartbeat. Um, and so there was no, nothing answered there in that moment, except my pregnancy wasn't viable, but I wasn't aware. And so we left and, um, they didn't say anything to follow up. They just kind of was like, call us if anything changes. And, um, we get home and, um, I now know, cause I've had a live successful birth that I was having contractions and the contractions were equally as painful as my pregnancy and birth with my son. Um, so I, the contraction started and I um, miscarried naturally at home, which is the biggest blessing because when you're at risk for ectopic, the way, I mean, you could lose a fallopian tube, you could die, you could, the med, the medicine is sticks in your body for six months. Like it's endless. The, the scary things with ectopic so to miscarry at home was very um it's weird it was like a relief but also the worst thing you've ever experienced in your life so it was turmoil you know the whole thing was but um yeah that was 
so impactful for sure. I'm so sorry that that was your experience. I mean, I can't believe the way that they handled your loss. I mean, you're going through something so incredibly traumatic and they just kind of blow you off. Like, Mm -hmm. oh, she doesn't know what she's talking about. She doesn't like, didn't prepare you for anything. Didn't, I mean. Yeah. Oh my goodness. And I've thought so many times about writing the hospital that I experienced all this at. And I, but I, you know, I'm just like, oh my goodness, you just have no idea like how traumatic it was and how different it could have been. Not that the loss would be any less worse, but the treatment could have been much better. <laughs> right. And I feel yeah. like, you know, there's not like a standard treatment for people who go through loss. It just, you know, you could have a great doctor and it could be a, I mean, like you said, the loss isn't good, but the experience itself can be as good as it can be. Or you could be stuck with, you know, the crappy doctor who doesn't care. And that really makes a difference in your healing experience. Oh my goodness. Yes. And, um, when I had, after I had my loss, I called the, the office that day and I told them and the nurse, she said, okay, call us when you're pregnant. (laughs) <laughs> like yeah. thanks uh <laughs> yeah like that's not really what I'm thinking about right now but okay <laughs> yeah you can you can try again next month so um yeah <laughs> did they ever um figure out why your hormone levels were off so come to find out well this was a self-led uh, instinct I knew my loss, I knew enough about hormones to know that my loss probably wasn't just because the way they like to, it just happens. I just didn't feel settled with that. So I found a new, a new doctor. And when I had gotten to her, it was three months since my loss. And, um, she did a new blood work and listened to all my symptoms, all my, um, struggles. And I was diagnosed with PCOS. So, um, that was definitely the cause. And, um, I was so relieved cause I had an answer, but, um, you know, it's also bittersweet cause if I had known I had it years prior, maybe, you know, but yeah, so it, mine solely was hormone, you know, hormone based. I actually, I have PCOS as well. So I'm, I'm familiar with all the joys of that. (laughs) I had the same, you know, kind of hormone issues. Um, so my question about that is, um, do you feel like once you've got that diagnosis, do you feel that you've got adequate information about it? Um, well, the doctor that diagnosed me, she was my doctor that delivered my son and I loved her to death. She really, instilled hope. And she's like, you have PCOS. This is how we're going to get pregnant. So in a, in a way I felt supported and like I, and in the first month it was successful. So, I mean, yes, but I still had to research all about PCOS on my own. So it's kind of the, like, all the legwork has to be done within you if you want to know more and how to like holistically and not everybody does, but it's so important to know that like your stress can correlate with your hormones or your, you know, your lifestyle. So I guess, no, I I wasn't super informed until I took the wheel and decided to research. That's kind of, you know, my same experience. I was, I was diagnosed at a young age when I was 16, but, Mm -hmm. um, it was basically just here's some birth control. Um, you know, Mm -hmm. when you want to get pregnant, you can come back and, you know, you're 16. So you're not like thinking about getting pregnant. So like, okay. And then, you know, I'm, um, I just turned 36 this year and this, I mean, this past year, I've just learned so much about PCOS Mm -hmm. that I wish I had known before, like, yeah, I came back with like high cholesterol from the doctor. Didn't know that was related to PCOS. You know, the high cortisol, like you mentioned, like it's just all this stuff. And I'm like, why does nobody tell us this stuff? I know. And it's like crucial information. Exactly. You know? <laughs> like, you know, all the health conditions that can be caused because of it. 
I know the diabetes, the, you know, just like, and I can't tell you how many women I've met in my community, um, about like they have PCOS and their only thought is like, but it doesn't matter until I try to get pregnant. And I'm like, but you can learn how to live with it. And like, you could get pregnant with PCOS naturally if you wanted, like if you put that much, everybody's different, but you know, it's right. possible. It's not impossible, but um, yeah, it's just, there's like such a disconnect between how we can, um, you know, help ourselves for sure. So did you do like research on the, the diet side of things too? Cause that's been yeah. interesting for me. I, I read it and I was like, I don't like that. <laughs> <laughs> it was, I was overwhelmed for a yeah. while. I was, I think, cause I was diagnosed right before my pregnancy. So I was kind of overwhelmed through my whole pregnancy. And it was until after that I really dove in, but I, before I got pregnant, I did I felt very like inflammation in my body was really a problem. And that PCOS, that is like, we are always inflamed. That is like a direct symptom. And I stopped eating gluten and um, that's not for everybody, but I like immediately shed like 20 pounds and like, it was crazy. I could just feel, I never felt good with gluten or sugar, like, you know, so I knew I just felt led to make that change and it helped a lot. I'm trying to work on making those changes. So hearing yeah. stuff like that is helpful because <laughs> it's just, you know, it, it's, it sounds overwhelming. Like you said, it's like, oh my gosh, yeah. but I, but I eat this every day. How am I supposed to not eat it? You know, I know I have learned that when it's good quality gluten, it doesn't affect me, but if it's just kind of yucky, um, immediate, like, I could just feel the bloating, the every, you know, all the symptoms, the brain fog and the fatigue and the, it's crazy. So, which I'm guessing most of it is probably not the good quality gluten in yes. a lot of the stuff we eat. <laughs> I know. And it's not like we can like everything we eat. So I just, you know, indulge when I want. And then most of the time I don't. So, so how was pregnancy after loss for you? Was, did you have a lot of anxiety uh, surrounding that or, um, yes. So when I got pregnant with my son, I was five months postpartum to my loss and I definitely wasn't healed. Um, I think in the month that I was pregnant, um, that was probably the lowest point I've ever had in my whole life. And, um, so when I got pregnant, like you kind of feel like it's not real, very numb, or at least I did. Um, so I had to work through healing from a loss, but also being pregnant. And, you know, when you've had loss, it's like, I mean, I laid in the bed for a long, a good part of my beginning of my pregnancy. And I just didn't want to move. I didn't want to do anything to interrupt it. Um, so it was hard. We didn't really t acknowledge it in our household up until we um, saw the or heard the heartbeat and learned that everything was okay. So really until 12 weeks, we were kind of like elephant in the room and we're just gonna, you know, hope everything goes well. So um, it was hard. It was a lot of anxiety. Yeah, definitely. It's, you know, it's hard to Cause the loss creates, you know, that trauma that you, that you carry with you yeah. and it's hard, you know, it doesn't just go away overnight just because you get pregnant again. Yeah. Yeah. And it's so true. And like, even, um, you know, we're triggered by different things, but there was a point like at week 20 where I spotted and I was like, oh my goodness, this is this is happening again. But I was working way too much. So I had to kind of slow down, you know, and it was fine. But when I was delivering my son or in labor, um, I was very, very triggered at, it was like 12 hours into my labor and, um, the, um, dilating and the contractions, they felt like my miscarriage. And so I was like slipping in my head. So I got an epidural to like remove the stress of 
reliving the, I guess, PTSD kind of, you know, yeah, so it doesn't go away. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think yeah. people too often dismiss miscarriage, you know, like it, like it's no big deal. Like, you know, they don't, they don't tell you that you could have the contractions that you could birth your baby, you know, that mm-hmm. you go through these things. They just think, oh, you're just going to have a period and, and move on. And that's just not what yeah. it is for everybody. Yeah. Yeah. And they don't share, like, I had no idea that it, I bled for weeks and I like, you have no idea and it's very painful. And, you know, if you get it removed medically, that's a little different, but it, you know, there's a lot that they don't share for sure. So yeah. was there anything specifically that helped you with your grief? I would say, oh, um, I feel like I was so disconnected from my body after loss. Like I blamed myself because that's what we do. We look for a reason. Um, and I was just so numb that I was, well, I lived in the bathtub. So I just warm water. That was definitely a help, but, um, getting on the yoga mat and just like, I forced myself to just like stretch and move and feel my own strength and reconnect with my body. And I kind of, I would do it every day and the breathing techniques that keep you present and how to breathe through the stress. That was a huge support. And then after a while, you're like, I'm strong. I'm worthy. This wasn't because of me. I, you know, I have these imbalances, but I can also help myself. So movement, um, journaling, um, I, I read so many books on grief and, um, in my faith system, just, you know, trusting that there was a reason and, you know, so. Yeah. I found that sometimes it, you know, after loss, it's really hard to to want to take care of yourself because sometimes you're just like angry at your, at your body or, you know, at what happened. And I think like start or getting yourself to start exercising, you do (laughs) kind of have to force it a little bit, but then I found that, you know, once you get back to it, like it feels good and you keep doing it. Yeah. And it was the only way that I could be out of my mind for that short period of time to not think about it. So, um, it was so helpful. And I don't know about you, but I'm, you know, definitely a person that likes to be in control of everything. And, um, (laughs) yeah, that's something you have absolutely no control over and I hated it, but at least with controlling the things like exercise or, or diet or things like that, I felt like I was actually in control of something. Yes. And that was, such a huge lesson in maybe even before I got pregnant successfully was just like trusting that like not getting attached to the outcome but trusting that whatever is supposed to happen will and um losing the control of thinking that I could you know that it would happen so it's it's a lot mentally that they don't you know nobody shares that stuff with you so Yeah. It's kind of something we have to all learn as we go through it. Yes. Yes, absolutely. So did you get a lot of support from family and friends? Like when you were going through infertility and loss? Um, no. Um, yes and no. People were aware that we were trying, but it was more like you're, you're putting too much into it. Just calm down. Just just it, it's going to happen, you know, and I just knew that something was wrong. So all that I was doing, people would be like, you're doing too much, just, you know, stop trying to focus on it. And yeah. And then after my loss, um, it was really interesting. You see how people really feel about you and, um, you know, not everybody's able to carry your grief with you, but, um, it was very eye opening to relationships that I, you know, thought were extremely close, but you know, that didn't work out. So. 
It is always surprising who shows up for you and who doesn't. Yeah. It's, it's usually not the people you expect. Yeah. It's kind of amazing. And I think in that area, that's what has made me want to help others because, um, you know, it's so important that we don't feel so alone. So you said that you are studying to be uh, an integrative health coach and uh, a bereavement and loss doula. So yes. do you want to talk a little bit about that? Sure. Um, my business is called Bravely She Blooms Wellness. And um, in April, I became certified as integrative health coach, um, which basically I didn't know health coaches or coaching was a thing when I went through all of this. And if I did, I would have absolutely trusted somebody to help me along the way. Um, as a coach, I kind of help piece together like diagnoses that like were the downfall that doctors can't explain or spend the time, everything that they just kind of send you on your way to research on your own. That's where I come in and be like, here's what you're going through. Here's how we can work, move forward, be accountable, you know, create change. So with the health coach, um, I'm currently studying um, hormones in a really extensive level to be able to specialize in those um, so I'm kind of piecing together my dream job because there's nothing like that. Um, and then a bereavement doula, um, bereavement and loss doula that's, that has been transformative. Um, just adding an, a layer of compassion and knowing all the ways that people can have loss, what can happen and how to help them better. So, um, studying a lot. <laughs> Yeah, that sounds really interesting, though. I mean, there's, I never knew that there was, you know, so much to know about hormones until I started, oh my you know, le learning about PCOS. And I'm like, and this is just a few hormones, like, you know, know, there's so many. Oh my goodness. It's so, yeah, everything that we consume is translated into a hormone, but we just, you just don't know those, like, it's amazing how it all works. But um, I'm very, passionate and I just want to help women understand like here's what you're going through it's normal like you're not alone so um yeah so what are like the types of things you learn about hormones is it like like what they do or like how to balance them or like that kind of thing um it's kind of like well kind of everything but essentially you learn how they function in your system um where they live and what they work, what, where they partner, what organs they work with, and then how to nourish in a healthy way that feeds them and fuels them versus, um, you know, depleting them. And our lifestyle has a lot to do with that, our stress levels. Um, but it's fascinating. I think all aspects I've been learning about, but um, how to nourish them in a healthy way to make live your best life with PCOS or with an imbalance. And I didn't realize with imbalances, not PCOS, you can't, PCOS is not something you can cure, but an imbalance is with efforts, you know, naturally or, you know, holistically. So, um, there's a lot, there's so much, uh, to learn about. And I, I feel like that's what I did through my whole experience was research. So I feel like I'm a good source of like, here's what's happening and why, you know, like, cause it's so overwhelming. <laughs> is that what inspired you to, to do it is because you had to go through it? Yes. I think in reflection to my experience, I definitely felt extremely alone and, um, I knew that it wasn't just for, I wasn't experiencing it just because I knew that it was kind of for a purpose. And so I took it as like, this is how I'm going to help others. Cause I've always helping people is like my, um, love language for sure. And, um, you know, there's so many that are struggling that don't talk about it. 
so many women. And so I think the lack of medical care was a huge catapult into um, how can I make it better for somebody else? Um, Yeah. And all this knowledge, I'm like, I can pay it forward and help the person behind me, you know? And I love that you're doing that to help people. I didn't know that coaching was a thing either. You know, that would have been really helpful (laughs) when I was going through it. (laughs) I know. I'm like, I would have paid anything to just know like, oh, you're not alone. Okay. (laughs) Yeah. And to just know that there were things that I could do on my own. You you know, we saw uh, the reproductive endocrinologist. They're just like, take this medicine, do these shots. This is what you do to get pregnant. Nothing about diet, nothing about exercise, nothing about stress, nothing about any of that. Just take this medicine to get pregnant. Yeah. It's crazy. And I mean, and that like I did Clomid and it worked, but I also stopped eating gluten. I, you know, all the things slept more. So yeah, it, why not make your chances way better and your experience way better if you can. So plus then, you know, with the PCOS, then you're also eliminating all those other things that you could develop yes. too. So it's, it's really for yes. your benefit, right? <laughs> Yes. When I first was overwhelmed with PCOS, there was, what did I read? It was like, this is not like a life sentence. This is how you can live your best life because, you know, these things will always be a struggle and very important. So why not live well? (laughs) Yes. That's a, that's a good point. You know, I, like I said, I, when you see the diet, it's like no sugar, no gluten, no dairy, no alcohol. No. I'm like, well, what do you eat? (laughs) I know. But but like you said, you know, it doesn't have to be a negative way to look at it. You can look at it like, okay, I'm, I'm doing it to protect my body. I'm not, it's not a punishment. Yeah. It's like a partnership versus, you know, a punishment. Absolutely. Cause I used to think too, like, well, it's not fair that, you know, I can't eat this stuff and everybody else can, but then you you are like, well, really nobody should be eating like that. that." Absolutely. (laughs) It's just that, (laughs) you know, the, the PCOS diet is the one that I guess calls it out. (laughs) Yes, definitely. It does. So have you, um, have you done anything yet? Like with the bereavement and lost doula, uh, stuff that you're learning? I, my goal is to be finished with that certification in probably in the middle of June. That is my goal. Um, I feel like there are so many ways to go with that certification that um, I don't necessarily need to be with them as they're experiencing the loss. But I think my calling is to be a source that they can call for support kind of like lending a hand, not like a miscarriage hotline, but more like, you know, here's what you're experiencing. Here's what's to come. I want to help you. Even if it's a phone call, a video chat, something um, in support. Um, I was, I think I'm going to connect with like women's centers and, um, you know, the ones that are experiencing loss have somewhere to call if they, um, you know, need support, but, um, just knowing all the forms of loss and, you know, it's, um, very opening for sure. It is something I, I never knew until I went through it, you know, how many different kinds there were and how many, how many women went through it. Yes. And, you know, up all the way until delivering like a stillborn, like that's, you know, and it shifts as you, your gestation grows. So, um, you know, it's heartbreaking and, and at any point. So I just want to be a light for somebody else. So do you have any advice for people that are going through infertility and loss? I would say, oh my goodness. For one, like my biggest thing is like, you just don't have to be alone, you know, in any circumstance, if you're feeling unsupported by your family members or your partner wants to stop trying or, you know, motherhood is not something you can just turn off. That desire doesn't go away. So, you know, support, I'm here for support because, you know, I felt so alone. So that's my biggest 
thing. And then don't settle for poor medical treatment. Like that really does shape a trauma versus an experience that is terrible. But like we said, it doesn't have to be so traumatic. So if, if you're not feeling heard in the medical setting, move on until you do, because you don't have to settle. Um, and then, you know, if you're ready to try again after loss, that's a, that's huge. And um, also you don't have to feel alone. And every month when you have to relive trauma or the negative tests or anything, um, you know, put yourself first. This is the time to put yourself first and um, your well being and all the things I've talked about health wise, your well being is so worth it. So I think, you know, learning to advocate for ourselves is definitely yeah. a, a big thing. You know, it's something that a lot of us aren't very good at until you yeah. teach yourself to do it. I know this totally was my blooming because um, I did not you know, I thought that was how I was supposed to be treated. And then you're like, no, no. Nope. Yeah. When you learn later and you're like, oh, like, why did I put up with that? You know? know, but you don't know any different at the time. Cause you're like, this is just how it is. Yeah. And then turns out it's not. <laughs> <laughs> so do you have anything else that you would like to share or add? Um, I would say the biggest thing thing that I um, find that there's like maybe people are just unaware or unfamiliar but the correlation between like our mind and our body is so strong and just to value your stress levels and just take accountability and assess where you're at in your life are you um do you feel like your lifestyle could, you know, support a baby? Do you feel like your stress levels could like those things matter? And so, um, you know, again, it's such a huge time for putting yourself first and seeing what you could handle, what you could move through to clear the way for this baby, this miracle. And I like that advice too, because then, you know, you're, you're, not just making your body ready for a baby, but you're improving yourself as well in yeah. other areas. So it's, it's a win-win. <laughs> yes. And when you when if there is a successful pregnancy and you know, um, time is not your own after you <laughs> have a child or anything. Yes. So it, <laughs> this is your time to just, it is, you know, setting you up for success. Exactly. (laughs) I have very little time anymore. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) So if people wanted to find out more information about your services, do you have a website or where would they go for that? Um, I'm on Instagram and my handle is bravely. She blooms wellness. That's where you can find me uh, most often. I do have a Facebook with my name, Kendra Alexander and a business page. But um, either one of those, I can definitely just reach out and I'm here to connect for sure. Well, I want to thank you so much for coming on today and sharing your story with us. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much, Kendra, for sharing your story with us. I wanted to touch on the fact that you took your health into your own hands after not getting the help and the support you needed from your doctors. In fact, you had a pretty terrible experience with your doctors, you know, completely diminishing your concerns and, you know, not taking your health seriously. And I think taking your health into your own hands is a great message to talk about. The bottom line is that we are responsible for our own health. We are the ones who know our body best. No one else knows our body like we do. So when we feel something is wrong, oftentimes we're right. Admittedly, we're not always right. Sometimes we can overreact, but a lot of times I think we are in tune to what our body is trying to tell us. And sometimes it's trying to tell us that something is wrong, but the doctors don't always want to listen. So the point is, when you feel doctors are not listening, find one who does. Switch doctors. Don't be afraid to bring up suggestions you may have seen elsewhere. 
Yes, we are always told not to use Dr. Google, but I do think Google can be useful sometimes. It can help us see what other people with our same conditions have tried, what has worked for others, and what may not have worked for others. Asking your doctor for a specific test or treatment option is our right. It doesn't mean we're trying to play the doctor. It just means we're invested in our health and in our outcomes. So again, remember, you are the one in charge of your health. Don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. Please leave a review or a rating to help the show reach more people. Thank you so much for tuning in, and remember, we are all in this together.